Hey friends, it's Rachel. Welcome back to my channel and welcome to another monthly reading wrap up where I share with you all of the books I read this month. In the month of January, I read five books. I intended to read a lot more than that and I usually do in January, but I had quite a few DNFs and then stuff just started happening and January is over now and I'm just like, what even is time? Two of the books I read this month were from the library and I no longer have them so I don't have the physical copy to hold up so I will put the cover on the screen. The first book I read this month was The Woman at the Front by Leisha Cornwall. This book is about a woman named Eleanor who is a doctor, not a nurse, a doctor, but she cannot establish a practice of her own because she is a woman and therefore she is looked down upon and viewed as being incapable of being a doctor. Being a doctor was definitely viewed at the time that this book takes place as being a solely male profession. So she helps her father at his practice doing menial tasks, but she is given the opportunity to travel to the front in World War I to be the private doctor of a noblewoman's son. And while she's there, she becomes involved with taking care of the other men who are injured and dealing with the fighting and everything that comes with that, while also trying to navigate her growing feelings for one of the men in particular. I really liked Eleanor's character. I found her to be relatable and very easy to root for. It made me angry to read this book just the way that she was treated and looked down upon with disdain simply because she was a woman even though she was very capable in her own right as a doctor and it was just kind of foolhardy to, to me to see these men not want to be treated by her because she was a woman and that was all they saw. They didn't care that she was a fully qualified doctor. They would rather wait for a male doctor to get there to treat them and I'm like, well if you just want to bleed out while you're waiting, be my guest because that's what's going to happen. It was it was kind of so just irrationally stubborn on the part of some of these characters and it's just the height of foolishness to be laying there bleeding and refusing the treatment that she's offering simply because she's not a male doctor. It's clear that a lot of effort and research was put into this book, especially in terms of historical detail about the war itself, which I really appreciated. The romance in this book was both a hit and a miss for me. There are three men in the story that are interested in Eleanor and it's very clear early on which one she's going to end up with. It seems to me to be kind of a trope in romance, the way that the book tells the reader which one the love interest is going to be. Like, I don't know. There was never any doubt in my mind as to which of the characters Eleanor was going to end up with. It's almost like the book wants you to know that by conveying how the main character reacts to this said love interest. That kind of gives away who it's going to be. I found it a little bit unrealistic to have all of the stomach flip-flopping and the heart beating really fast when she doesn't really even know this guy yet. I just... It irritates me a little bit because she is such a professional person and then when she lays eyes on this hot guy that kind of goes away a little. However, what I did like about the romance is that Eleanor did end up with the character that I thought she ought to have ended up with, that I thought would have been the best fit for her and that's exactly what happened. So I was happy about that. He's a good man and he respects her and it's always nice when you have a relationship in a book where the characters respect each other and treat each other the way they're supposed to. I did feel that their initial attraction was a little bit insta-love but they do go through a events together and develop chemistry because of those events and I did come to believe in their relationship and that they have genuine chemistry. And because this book does take place in the middle of a war, I'm willing to overlook a little bit of a lack of chemistry simply because this is war and there's horrible things happening and people are wondering if they're even going to live to see the next morning and that definitely makes them maybe more risky, maybe more willing to rush into things where otherwise they would have waited. But I was pleasantly surprised by just how much I did enjoy this book and it was a very nice way to start the year off. The next book I read was The Collector's Daughter by Jill Paul. This is the story of Lady Evelyn Herbert. She grew up in the real life castle where Downton Abbey was filmed and she is the daughter of a collector of Egyptian antiquities and she went with Howard Carter to Egypt and was there at the discovery of King Tut's tomb. In fact, some accounts have her as being the very first person in modern times to enter the tomb. And of course, most of us have heard of the legend of the Pharaoh's curse and the series of unfortunate events that befell some of the people shortly after the opening of the tomb. Evelyn never really believed in the curse, but this book kind of explores all of the bad things that happened since then 
and in her later life she begins to wonder if there is in fact something to the curse after all. I found this book to be a bit slow at times, especially at the beginning, and also in the beginning it suffers a bit more from telling rather than showing. The main thing about this book that I want to say is that I found the marketing to be pretty misleading. This is a dual timeline historical fiction novel, and I am not a particular fan of dual timeline historical fiction. It's okay, but it's not my favorite to read, so if you're not a fan of that, please be aware that this is very much dual timeline. I kept expecting this book to stop switching back and forth. The two timelines are the 1920s and the 1970s, with the 70s being the present in this book when Eve is an old woman, and then we have flashbacks to the 20s and the opening of the tomb and all of that stuff. I kept expecting the timeline to finally switch back into the 1920s and stay there, but it never did. It continues to switch between the two all the way until the end of the book. Of the two timelines, the 1920s timeline was obviously more interesting, and so that was why I was hoping that it would eventually switch back to the 20s and stay there, but again, it never does. Although this book is marketed as a novel of the discovery of King Tut's tomb, it's actually more about Eve's declining memory in the present timeline. And that's what ultimately makes this, in my opinion, a sad book. In the 1970s timeline, Eve has suffered a series of strokes. She suffered them ever since she got into a serious car accident in the 30s, and each stroke steals a little bit of her memory away. And it's just sad to read about, to see her slowly diminish and lose bits and pieces of herself and not remember anything or anyone anymore. In fact, there's a scene where someone that she knows has died and her daughter is discussing the funeral arrangements with her and she's like, a funeral? Who died? And it's like she doesn't even remember that this person that she knew died very recently, and that's just so sad to me. Losing your memories of the people in your life and then slowly losing yourself as well has to be one of the worst fates that I can imagine. It's just pretty horrible, and although this book was well written, it just left me feeling kind of dead inside by the time that I finished it. It was certainly not the historical fiction rump through Egypt that I thought I would be getting. Next up is Down a Dark River by Karen Auden. This book takes place in London in 1878, and the main character's name is Michael Corovan. I think I'm pronouncing that right, I'm not entirely sure. He's an inspector with Scotland Yard, and he is tasked with solving this bizarre murder that is discovered on the Thames, where this young woman is discovered dead in a boat. And there are more young women who follow after her, who are killed and placed in boats as well. And so Coravan, having once worked as a member of the River Police, is perfectly placed to solve this murder. But the Scotland Yard also recently underwent a scandal, where some inspectors were found guilty of taking bribes. And so Scotland Yard is in a very precarious position right now, and they cannot afford to make a single mistake. This book was written in first-person point of view, from Coravan point of view, and since it is written in a man's point of view but written by a woman author, I thought that was very interesting because it's just not something that I encounter most of the time, but I thought that Coravan was written very realistically as a character. I enjoyed the writing style and the characters. My only real criticism of this book is that there was a lot going on. It's not as straightforward as you have this mystery where this woman's body is found in a boat, and that the characters are going to be investigating that. There's multiple mysteries that all weave together in the end, of course, but getting there is a bit confusing. And there are a lot of names in this book. There are a lot of side characters whose names are mentioned and who come up, and it's a little bit confusing trying to remember who is who, and what part of the mystery they're involved in versus what part they are not involved in. I also did not figure this mystery out. I fell from one of the red herrings and thought that I had it solved, but I did not. The next book I read was The Other Einstein by Marie Benedict, and since I liked the other book by this author that I read, which was The Only Woman in the Room, about Hedy Lamarr, I decided that I would give this book a try. This book is about Einstein's first wife, Maliva. I'm probably pronouncing her name horribly wrong, but I'm sorry. She met him at university and she was very highly intelligent and that is what initially drew him to her and the two of them fell in love and married. The only problem is that after they were married, Einstein turns out not to be the man that Maliva believed him to be. They collaborated on projects and then Einstein had her name removed and didn't give her credit for it. And basically, this is the story of a woman who was lost in Einstein's shadow. When we hear the name Einstein, we think of Albert Einstein. 
and we don't think about his first wife and the fact that she may have been just as brilliant as he was. I found this book to be much slower paced than The Only Woman in the Room and I enjoyed the first book by this author that I read far more than I enjoyed this one. This is a depressing story and there's not much to be happy about here. Maliva is basically trapped in a marriage to a man who doesn't appreciate her brilliance and doesn't want to give her credit for the work that she does. Instead he takes all of the credit for himself and there's really nothing that she can do about it. There's just one event after another in which he treats her horribly and leaves her to basically deal with the consequences and pick up the pieces on her own. However, the biggest concern that I have about this book is the accuracy and how true any of this really is. Now, with the only woman in the room, that was all true. Hedy Lamarr had an acting career. She escaped Austria and the Nazis. She came to Hollywood and had an acting career there. And she did help develop a new technology to guide torpedoes that happened to be better than what the Navy had. And they did reject her idea simply because she was a woman. However, we don't really know for certain if any of the stuff that takes place in this book is real, in terms of the minutia of Albert and Maliva's relationship. We don't really know if Maliva contributed anything to his work. So the fact that he had her name removed from the collaborations that they do together, we don't have any proof that that happened in real life. Is it possible? Yes. Do I think it probably happened? Yes. But the problem is that we just don't know. I think that if someone has a genius level intellect like Albert Einstein did, I think it would be pretty hard not to be arrogant about it. I think maybe it's reasonable to assume that he did feel threatened by Maliva's intelligence and it is completely possible that she was the one that invented the theory of relativity, but the problem is we just don't know that. And the fact is that we just don't know if the way that Albert is portrayed in this book we don't know whether that's accurate or not. We do know some things through letters that they shared that were saved and that still exist today and so part of Part of it is probably true. I think he probably did treat his wife less than he should have, but as far as the nitty gritty details of everything that went on, we, there's just no way for us to say one way or another if this is true. And that makes me a little bit uncomfortable because there are people who are going to read this book who think that it is completely true and that Albert Einstein was this terrible person who took credit for all of his wife's work. And basically this historical figure who was a real person may end up being maligned because of the way things are portrayed in this book and we just don't know if it's true or not. Even though I did enjoy reading the book in terms of the writing style itself, my thoughts on this book can basically be summed up in this Goodreads review. It says, Dear Albert Einstein, you're a total misogynistic a-hole. Unless this author created most of this book, which the author's note at the end of the book makes me wonder, then my apologies. Regards, confused historical fiction fan. And that just sums up my feelings on this book probably better and more succinctly than I ever could. And lastly, we have One Fatal Flaw by Anne Perry. This is the third book in the Daniel Pitt series. Daniel Pitt is the son of Charlotte and Thomas Pitt, who have their own mystery series, which I love very well and which I have talked about extensively on this channel. In the series, Daniel is a young lawyer, but he would much prefer to follow in the steps of his detective father. And in this book in particular, a young woman comes to Daniel wanting his help in defending her boyfriend who has been accused of murder because there was a fire set in a warehouse and another young man died in the fire. She's saying that it was an accident and the prosecutors think that this was murder because the two men had a rivalry together. So Daniel's friend Miriam enlists the help of a fire forensics expert who gives testimony during the trial which proves that the fire in fact may have been an accident and not murder and the young woman's boyfriend is found not guilty. However, the young man is then found murdered himself in a way exactly like the previous fire. So that is definitely suspicious and raises some eyebrows. And Daniel uncovers evidence that this expert's testimony is in question and he's kind of unscrupulous in his methods and he may have given testimony in other cases that had people falsely convicted of murder via arson and that needs to be set right and this guy needs to be called out for what he's done. I very much enjoy this series. I don't like it quite as much as the Charlotte and Thomas Pitt series because those are more mysteries and while these are also mysteries there's less of a mystery element to it I suppose because Daniel is a lawyer and not a policeman. I found this book to be a bit slow paced. Um, I did think that the antagonist character did what he did very well. He's very good at being an antagonist and I really don't like him. I find the idea of forensics really starting to come into its own at this time, an interesting subject, specifically 
the forensics of fires and arson because I just didn't know anything about that. So as for any more specifics about this book, I won't say anything because of spoilers. And as always, if you'd like to start this series, I always recommend starting with the first book. Not this one because this is the third one. So that is it. Those are all of the books that I managed to read in January. I hope that I can get back to my usual reading amount in February, but that is a shorter month, so we will see when we get there. That is the end of this video. If you enjoyed, feel free to leave a like, comment, and subscribe so you don't miss out on any future content. I appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you in the next video. Bye!